Yo, vlog one fam. Welcome back to Bougie Jamaican. It's Aaron. Yo, today, like I said, like I promised, we we're going to get into tasting reds and how to break them down, how to go over it. And also this time what I'm going to do is we're also going to, I'm going to show you and teach you how to tell if a wine is off. Because if you have a shitty wine, I ain't going to lie, that shit is gross. Remember to hit that like, like and subscribe button if you like this video. You know, today's sponsor is me because ain't nobody give a shit. So let's get into it. Happened to me the week before, bought a bottle, took a sniff. It was like, what the fuck is this? It smells like goddamn mold and wet cardboard. Decided to try it anyways, just to double check to see if I was stupid or just going crazy. And I was not, because it was disgusting. It was absolutely horrendous. We got Canoe Bridge uh, 2014 Cab Sav from, where are we from? From the US, uh, Walla Walla. All right, we'll learn. we're going to test it out. We're going to try it, we're going to break it down. This is one we're going to try. I've actually opened this up a few hours ago, so I let it aerate just a little bit more. It is 2014, I bet it probably could sit for a couple more years if I really wanted to, but we are going to try it. The first thing that we gotta do, of course, is grab your glass, pour it, and let's get into it. All right, as we stated off before, the first thing that you're gonna do is check out the clarity. You're gonna hold it on that 45 degree angle. When now, when we talk about reds, there's three major colors that we're going, we're going to look for. The purples, the rubies, and garnet. We're going to judge the intensity from, of course, pale, to medium, to deep. This one, Mmm, this, like this is like a deep purple. It's a deep purple. You can almost go with medium garnet. It does have a little bit of brownish notes on the side. It's clean. There's no hints of sediment in it. It's not cloudy. It's not foggy. It's a nice clean one. Next, of course, we're going to get into the nose. What does it smell like? What are we going to do? We want to swirl that. Now, we want to be bougie. Stick that pinky out because you know you can't taste properly if that pinky ain't out. Smell. Whew. Oh, I like that. Oh, that's deep. Oh, this has got some deep notes to it right there. Super intense. Super intense. It has a little bit of alcohol burn in the back end, but that is intense flavor. Like it's 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 intense. Is what I can say. It has clean nose. It's clean nose. But I would definitely say pronounced the aroma characteristics. Hmm. I got a little bit of herbaceousness, a little bit of it's either green pepper. I would say probably green pepper. It's got a little bit of leather or smoked meat notes to it. Red, red currant, maybe a little bit of blackberry. Tart, tart, like a tart blackberry. A red cherries, like underripe, almost like a sour cherry to a point, almost like sour cherry. And it does have like a little bit, yeah, definitely that smokiness to it. There's that little bit of that peppery, it's like it's a little bit of pepper notes to it. Like they say, don't say spicy. It's not, I wouldn't say spicy, but maybe a tiny bit of pepper, but yeah, some dark, some nice dark fruits in there. Oh, maybe a bit of plum, no. Maybe a little bit of plum behind it. We'll see, we'll see. So, since we got the nose, because this is, we're looking at this nice dark red, and it has that little bit of garnet, to tell if this red was oxidized, it would be like a super brown, it'd be very dull. It happens when there's too much air that has gotten into the wine, and this can happen in very beginning stages. It can happen from the bottling process. It can happen from like the aging process. It can happen anytime. It can, like it could be a bad cork for instance. And as it was bottled and it was corked, it could sit there and air just flows into it and oxidizes it. And how to tell if a wine's oxidized is one, it's going to give off a vinegary flavor, um, a vinegary smell. It's going to smell like, I don't know, have you ever just smelled like apple cider vinegar or say like white vinegar to smell it? it smells like vinegar. The color is going to be a, like a dingy brown. It's going to look dull. Also, the aromas, you won't be able to get the actual flavor because the profile of the smell from it, if it is oxidized. 
So you won't actually be able to pick up those notes. You won't be able to say, okay, this is this. You'll just be like, it smells like nothing. What the fuck am I drinking? I'm smelling nothing. And that's one of the biggest things. And that's how you can tell if it's oxidized. Now, when I was talking about, say, cork taint, when we talk about that, it starts off what it's from, a cork taint, it's actually a chemical compound. It's a chemical compound. Uh, what happens is, say, it's a mixture of dampness, chlorine, um, some mold. It usually originates either from natural cork, um, is what you'll find it in a lot of the time. But it can also happen in like the aging process and the bottling process as well. Uh, say in the winery, it could be there's a place that, like, say they cleaned out a vat, um, like a stainless steel vat with some chlorine or something like that, a little bit of mold started and some dampness was there. That can cause cork taint as well. Or if it was in, say, a barrel, whatever it is, that can cause cork taint. And how to tell if a, if a wine is tainted? For one, it's gonna smell like fucking wet cardboard or mold or sometimes like, fuck, like just rotten mushrooms. I find it's very like earthy to a point or wet cardboard, like wet paper, newspaper, like wet newspaper. Have you ever smelled like cardboard that's been out in the rain? That's what it smells like. It can go from extreme, from what I had the other day, to just a hint of it. And if it's just a hint, like you, I've had one where I knew it was kind of tainted and people's ranges can vary from what you can do. Like some people can tell it from right off the bat from very small traces of it, or some people don't even know, even if it's the wine's right, fuck that. Drink it or take it back. What I would say is if your wine's cork, take it back to your liquor store. They should take it back, get a new bottle. Around one to 15% of all wines are actually probably cork. It's a crazy statistic, but yeah, one to 15% of all wines are fucked. Straight from the beginning, before you even open it. No matter if you sit there and you age it and you're like, oh man, I got this 25, this bottle, I'm gonna age it for 25 years. The fucking thing's corked. You waste 25 years of your life, that sucks. You can't get a new one. But no, so that's one of the best ways to tell. And if it is just a little bit cork tainted, it won't be too bad. It'll be like musty. It'll have that musty smell. But when you taste it, you should be able to tell. It'll dull the flavor of everything. It'll bring it down kind of like with oxidization. Everything will be kind of less pronounced. It'll be boring. Like sometimes, a lot of the time, people will under, they'll have a wine and they'll say, hey, like, they'll drink it and they'll be like, ah, meh, I was kind of unimpressed. Didn't have a lot of flavors behind it. It didn't really do anything for me especially if it's something like this, like a big cap sap, where it should have a lot of flavor rate behind it. That could just be that slight cork taint. They could, that could just be it. That just makes the wine meh. So to a point where you don't really like it. Well, next is like Brettomyces, uh, or just Brett for short. It's actually just a yeast, but it's a natural yeast that can occur. Sometimes it can actually give off. Now this, the interesting thing about Brett is this, is sometimes it's meant to be there and like some wine makers really actually, they make their wine to actually have some of it. And what some of the notes that you'll get from it is that barnyard, you'll get sweat, gym socks, things like that, straw, that's kind of sometimes a little bit of that Brett behind it. So it's not always too bad. And this happens in reds and whites, but more, more often it actually occurs in reds than anything. So those are three of the major ones. There is a few more. I think there's seven or eight. Like you can get into like, re like secondary fermentation, where say this one should all of a sudden ferments again, and it's now sparkling when it shouldn't be. Things like that. There's UV light can change it. You can have heat damage that changes it. There's so much. I've had ones that I throw cold can damage it. Wine is such a finicky fucking product and it pisses me off to no avail sometimes, but I like it so much. Like, you can't leave this shit out in the sun. You can't leave it in a hot place because it will cook it, essentially. When I used to live in Mexico run it and I owned a bar in Mexico a couple years back, we, that was one of the biggest problems that I ever had when especially trying to buy wines in Mexico, was a lot of them were had heat damage because it was so warm. 
And so every time you try it, the wine would be fucked because it pr literally had been cooked. And if you've ever had cooked wine in cooking, especially when you're cooking a steak, that shit's delicious. But not when you're trying to enjoy it, just a nice drink. Those are the main ones. Let's get back into breaking this shit down. So, we already did the clarity, we already did the color. We look at the legs, this one has a lot more legs than say the white, so we know it has a little bit more sugar content, a little bit more alcohol content to that. I think this one's sitting at what, 14.8%. So of course, yeah, that sugar content's gonna be a lot higher. The alcohol content is that higher part too. We broke down the nose already, it was clean, it was clear, crisp, intense, I would say, Ooh, it's very pronounced. You want to use big fancy ass words? Things like pronounced and the nose and all this shit. This shit smells good. It doesn't smell bad, it doesn't smell off. It's pronounced, it has a lot of flavor behind it. The intensity is right there in your face. Once we did that, once we did the smell, next, after we smell, of course, we want to taste it. One of the best things I like about wine is that you can smell something and taste something that are completely different. Because the way that this smells and the taste behind it are just so different. And that's, I think that's fucking fun. I think that's cool. I mean, I'm sitting here trying to break it down in my head while I'm trying to tell you guys how to break it down in your head too. But Canoe Ridge, this reserve, this could actually, I'm gonna tell you right now, this could probably sit for quite a while. I could actually, if I was gonna buy another bottle, I'd lay this down for a while. The tannins aren't huge, but. Ooh. Sweetness, of course, not that sweet. We're talking about a medium wine. It, oh, like, a, like I said before, we're not doing sweet wines when we get into the ice wines, things like that. Then we're talking about sweets, especially when we're talking about, say, like Sauternes, things like that. Those are the sweet wines we'll talk about. But everything else is like dry, semi-dry. Now this one is an off-dry, medium-dry wine. The acidity, uh, I'd say it's medium low. It's not that super acidic. It's not making my mouth water that much, but it does have, it has a bit of tannins. It's got that medium tannin. The best way to explain tannins is I'd have to say is a word cloying. So it kind of makes your mouth pucker. So it kind of pulls that, it kind of like, when you fucking bite a lemon or something, it's like, ooh, you make, that's what it's cloying. Those are what tannins are. And you get those mostly from red wines because of the grape skins is what causes it. And so this one, you know, medium, medium tannins, not overly, not overly crazy. They're not fucking punching in the face. Like where you sit there and you're like, holy fuck, my mouth is just like a puckered asshole all of a sudden. It ain't like that. Alcohol, alcohol is not too pronounced. It's not overly, it, you can't really taste it as much. Um, probably say, eh, it's probably around a medium low for alcohol, for that tasting on it. Body, of course we're talking like a full body, this is a full body wine. Like it's, it's all there. Flavor characteristics. Now this is the one that, man, this perplexes me. It is perplexing to me. So this is where I was going to say we're going to get into the three different types of flavor characteristics and flavor intensities. So the flavor intensity, I would say it's medium because it's not crazy. You can't pick all of it up at once, but it has intensity behind it. But the full characteristics of these, we got the primary, secondary, and territory. We want to break these all down. And the best thing that I could suggest for anybody is if you ever want to learn more, is do the, go through the WSET programs. Like, man, they make learning about wine so fun. Just to, like I'm trying to do, but more, it's more for the professional setting. If you want to become like a sommelier, things like that, go into it, or just have some more knowledge. 
So primaries, these are the things that you get off straight off the bat. Like when I was talking about before, the key notes that you're going to get from certain wines, right? Those first things that you're always going to get. Like what I was saying, especially about um, Sauvignon Blanc, green bell pepper and the asparagus and that herbaceousness. When I taste this, definitely black currant. It's black currant instead of the red. It smells like red. That tastes like black currant. There's a little bit of that pepper in the back. Super subtle. I wouldn't say it's crazy. When we're talking about primaries, we're talking about like those fruits that we get, the fruit forwards that we get. Like the currants, pears, the apples, the honeysuckles, things like that. That's what the primary is that first thing, those big fruits of what it should kind of give you a hint of what it is. So definitely like a black currant, maybe a bit of blueberry behind it. Hmm. <sighs> what I find so, what I love about reds is that they're so intriguing to me. For me to break down a red takes me a lot more effort and actually I have to think about it so much more because I find there's so much behind it because you're going from, say the white, the Riesling that we went like through the other week is that Riesling was nice, it was crisp, it was clean, it was easy, clear cut, dry, done, boom, we're good, right? With reds, I always find that you have to break it down in so many ways that you gotta think, okay, all right, I got this black currant. I got that flavor of that black currant. Ooh, I got a little bit of that black, a little bit of that black pepper behind it. So those are like the main two things I would say that pop out at me first, first and foremost. Like there's, oh, there's a little bit of plum in there. Yeah, that little bit of that green pepper in the back, actually maybe more asparagus than anything. So then what is secondary? The secondary notes are those things that are like biscuits, breads, um, pastry, brioche, bread dough, like yogurts, cheese, like butters, oaks, cloves, like vanilla clove, all those things. That's the secondary notes that we're looking for. So when we do it again, I'm gonna actually have to pour some more because I'm gonna just keep drinking this as I try and break this down. Like I said, it's fun, like it's... It's a big wine. Just like cabs are supposed to be. They're perfect with steaks. This is a, this is a steak wine right here. You just get yourself like a nice T-bone, oh, nice piece of prime rib, whatever it is. This would go well with a big hearty meal. Oh yeah. Maybe a little bit of coffee to a point. And definitely a little bit of smoke. Like I was saying that smoked meat when I could smell it, kind of like smoked meat, like almost like campfire, but like so subtle, it's just like, it's just in that back end. And it's just so nice. The territory aromas and flavors that we're looking for right here are from like oxidization, from maturation, so length of time. So things more like are going to come out like cooked fruits, for instance like cooked berries, or like cooked apricot, or jams, that's where those jammies come from. Like cooked, like those cooked sweet fucking fruits, like honestly. Like those leathers, the forests, the, all that. So now we wanna try and look for that as we break it down, the cedars, the tobaccos, all that stuff. So, so the primary flavors are from the grape varietal and the fermentation process. The secondary flavors are from post. No, okay, all right. So the secondary flavors are from post fermentation and the winemaking process. And the territory flavors come from maturation and oxidization. And it also comes from like a little bit of that fruit development. So this is where I say you could sit this down. Like the tannins aren't super huge, but I could say you could put this down for another five years, another three to five years, and this would be just as good as it is now, if not better. I think you'd probably get a little bit more out of it too. But this is, this is nice, like this is good. 
So that vegetal, like that third flavor right there, that vegetal right off the bat, right there, just kind of hits you in the back. It's that green, that greenness. I don't really get anything, like we could go into it, but it's just, this is just fucking delicious, man. I can't really say too much. I'm just enjoying this now because this is actually really good. Like I could sit here and drink this whole thing. Like I don't even want to, but I shouldn't. I won't. I'm actually not going to. And this is a nice wine. Like with this, like I said, big hearty meal you could do. It would work and pair perfectly for it. Like in the next couple episodes, we're going to start getting into a bit more of, hmm, what should we get? Actually, you know what? Tell me what we should do next. What should we actually get into? Should we get into starting to break down like regions and old world versus new world? Actually, I think that's what we'll do next. We'll do old world versus new world. Then from there, let me know what you want to see. Do you want to do sub-regions and subcategories and stuff like that? Do you want to know the difference between like how to pick out French wines properly if you're going to go because French is a whole different fucking genre in its own goddamn self and they like to not put what actual grape varietals are on the bottle. You actually need to know what you're talking about to figure out what it is so you know what it is. Tell me what you want to see. Down the road I got a couple, I have really, some really good friends that I want to bring in, some really good sommeliers and they're actually going to help break us down some wines too and actually teach us a little bit more and they're amazing. We'll get them in. I'll get a couple, I'll get some friends that own a couple liquor stores and break down their favorite drinks and maybe their favorite wines, or if it's not wine, maybe a scotch or a whiskey, whatever it is, and we'll go through that. But yeah, let me know what you want. Tell me what it is, but until then, yo, stay safe, enjoy, because this is a good fucking glass. Pick this up if you actually want. I don't get paid by anybody. The only person that sponsors me is me, so fuck it. Yo, that's it. That's it for this week. Yo, if you like this video, remember to like and subscribe. Hit that like button, man, so we can keep doing this, keep drinking some great wines, keep breaking them down. Until then, it's a bougie Jamaican. Yana ma, c'est femme. Bless up to you.